to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 5. We'll continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Acts this morning. We've made our way to verse 12 of chapter 5. Today we'll start a two-part uh, message. I, I t- have it titled, Undaunted Faith. Undaunted Faith. Uh, we'll talk more about that, but let's read, uh, follow along at the reading of God's Word. Uh, Beginning in verse 12 of chapter 5, we're going to read down to verse 28. You can remain seated this morning as we read. Follow along, beginning in verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest uh, durst no man join himself to them, But the people magnified them, and believers were the more added to the church, multitudes, both men and women, insomuch that they were brought forth, that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them who were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people Uh, all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they were with him, and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found, we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they were uh, literally doubted of, of them how this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not literally strictly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Father, As you teach us from your word, may we genuinely seek that which is needed in our own life. As we speak of courage and boldness, Father, may we we be encouraged this morning to go forward from this day with the courage and boldness such as is demonstrated by the apostles in our text today. And we'll give you praise and thanks for that which you'll do in our lives, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I call this undaunted faith, and uh, you know, uh, I, I typically choose words carefully, and this word, a reason I call this because we are going to talk about courage, and we are going to talk about boldness uh, in the message today. Uh, one of the sad realities of the church today is there's a failure to encourage people to go strongly and boldly outside of your home and to teach and witness and testify of the gospel. The gospel is the, the, the most important thing to us. It's the most important thing because the word of God is God himself, as we understand. And this tells us, this is how we know about God is through his word. 
It's how we know about the way of salvation is through his word. It's the way we know about eternal life because it comes through his word. It's how we know about sin because it's in his word. And the word of God is so important. Paul characterized it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 when he said, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation. I think too many people this day and time are ashamed of the gospel, uh, are not understanding its power. And what we're going to see in our lesson today are uh, the apostles led by Peter uh, who undauntingly uh, approaches the masses in Israel with the gospel despite being threatened by the highest authority in the land. Uh, no fear, fearless determination to spread the gospel. And it shames us, shames us, and how, how we uh, fail to even talk, much less to boldly go forth with the courage that these apostles had when they went forward. I believe a lot of churches this morning are meeting and encouraging people to improve their relationships with each other, to improve their relationship with God. And these things aren't bad. They're good. They're good. But from week to week and from month to month and year to year, they leave out the strong meat of the word, which challenges us, and in fact, demands us to be the soldiers of the cross that God wants us to be. Uh, and we understand from Ephesians chapter 6 that it is a literal spiritual battle raging all around us. We're not living in a world that's just sort of free and easy and easy going. The people of the world live that way. But believers should understand there's an absolute war. If we had, you know, we, we had that balloon that came over the United States and went all the way from Alaska all the way down off the coast of South Carolina. And everybody's attention was drawn to this one balloon because it came from China. Folks, there's a, there's the Satan and his demons are, are very active. He's the prince and power of the air and they control this world. This world is their domain. Uh, we are in the, God, in the hands of God, those who know Christ through faith, and we are to be warriors for Him, literally fighting this spiritual battle every day. The best way we can fight it, of course, in Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us that the offensive weapon that we have is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. And so we should be taking the Word of God and going forward with it. We see Peter and the other apostles doing just that today. And they don't hold anything back. They are not... They are not discouraged at all because of threats on their life and because others have died for their faith in Christ. It doesn't stir or move them. They keep preaching and teaching even though they're threatened not to do it. So I want to talk about this word undaunted for a second because I've characterized the faith of the apostles this way and our faith should be characterized the same way. Undaunted in the sense, and uh, undaunted literally means courageously resolute. Courageously resolute. Resolute means absolute firm determination, especially in the face of danger or difficulty. So undauntedness comes particularly as characterizes the life that in, in, in Christian circles is a person who is saved by the grace of God, unashamed of the gospel as Paul, willing to risk their life, their reputation, and everything they have to get the word of God out. And we're afraid to even mention Christ in many circles. Uh, undaunted means we're not discouraged or intimidated. We're not afraid to continue despite danger. We're fearless, steadfast, undeterred in spreading the gospel through witness and testimony, teaching others. And this perseverance uh, that, I, that I've called undaunting is that which uh, is going to be, is gonna be um, fraught with setbacks, but that doesn't discourage nor deter us in our determination. We are re literally resolute 
and our determination to do this. Now, I want to take a look at just a couple of verses to characterize some other situations. Back in Joshua chapter 1, and we, we need to use the word to find encouragement to live our lives in accordance with God's desires. God wants us to be, to be undaunted in our faith, to be courageously resolute. Look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7. The scripture says, <clears throat> as Joshua was about to go in to take the promised land, remember 12 spies went out, 10 came back with a report that said, those people are huge. We, there's no way in this world we could take that land. The natural mind understood without the power of God, there's no way to do this. Two people thought with the power of God, it's a piece of cake, right? But God said this to Joshua before he took the first step into the promised land. He said in verse 7, only be thou, in other words, only is all, this is all you got to do. Only be thou strong and what? Very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, that's the word of God, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. We can be strong and we can be bold and we can be courageous. But if we're not students of scripture, surrendered to the will of God, and having our sins confessed in our life, then we're not going to be effective messengers or witnesses or warriors for the Lord. But it says, <clears throat> Do not turn from the word of God to the right hand or to the left, that thou, why? that thou mayest prosper wherever thou goest. This book of the law, that's the word of God, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, therein day and night. You see, the student, uh, the, the student of Scripture is the warrior. Because we can't be a warrior unless we're a student of Scripture. So we need to meditate on it therein day and night. That why? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, then shalt thou make thy way prosperous. And then shalt thou have good success. Have a night commanded thee. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. Now take a look at Esther. Just before the book of Job, if you take a look in the book of Esther, <clears throat> another example, we looked at Joshua, let's take a look at Esther. Um, Esther, uh, as they were, as the children of, of Israel were held captive, uh, she behaved herself in such a way, God put her in a position uh, to be elevated to the status of queen. And uh, there came a point in time when her people were, were, were decreed by the king uh, to, to be destroyed. They were all going to be killed. They were all going to be wiped out. Look at Esther chapter 4 and go to verse 8. And um, <clears throat> over in verse 8 of chapter 4, it says, Also he gave him a copy. This is uh, more to... Um, uh, this is, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given to Shushan to destroy them, that is, destroy the people of Israel. Mordecai got this um, uh, decree to Esther to show it unto Esther in verse 8 and to literally declare or explain it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people that she could save the people of Israel. They were all decreed to be killed. Mordecai lays this burden on her heart because she was in the right position to do it. If you take a look at verse 14, um, it says there, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, Mordecai message to Esther, if you don't do what you should be doing at this time, then shall there, um, uh, then shall there uh, relief and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. God's going to deliver his people, Mordecai is saying. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. He says, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We all have that time in our lives where the rubber meets the road, and we need to take a stand for Jesus. 
And that's literally what's happening to Peter and to John and the other apostles in the book of Acts in chapter 5. Is they've come to the point where <clears throat> they're taking a stand for Jesus. They've been threatened not to ever speak in the name of Jesus again. Well, guess what? God's going to get his word out, even if the rocks have to speak his word. And they will by God's power. But he's called the apostles and they have accepted the calling on their lives to fulfill their apostleship, the authority given to them. And they are going resolutely, if you will, with undaunted faith into the face of real danger. Uh, so here in, um, in this chapter, look at verse 16 in Esther 4. It says, Go gather together all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. What she's saying, Esther's saying there, back to Mordecai, is I'm going to go. I'm going to go. It's against the law for me to go. By the way, in that day, if, if she were to even be in the queen, anybody that goes before the king without being invited is slain right there. You have to be invited to go see the king. And she's saying, I'm going to go see the king, even though I know I may die in trying to get to him. But if I perish, I perish. That's undaunted faith in God. Sometimes I wonder if we really do take a stand for the Lord in our lives. Too many churches and pastors are preaching that it's an easy believism. And all you got to do is just follow the ways of Jesus. Jesus is all about love and kindness and compassion. And we just need to do the same thing to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, and all of our relationships and associations. Uh, we need to know how to be kind to people and gentle to people. And, um, and they... Even though much of that is absolute truth, they leave out the rest of the story. Because we're not called just to live a good life. This isn't even our world. This really isn't our life because our life is eternal life. This body now is not ours. It belongs to God. And we're to use it, we're supposed to be stewards of our own body and our mind and use it the way God wants us to use it. And that is to declare him wherever we go and to speak to others and to be bold in our profession of faith. Look at Acts chapter 20. We'll just uh, take a peek forward. We'll get there to do more verse by verse. But Paul was being um, encouraged by God to go to Jerusalem. And the, he's, he's been at Ephesus for a couple of years and he's speaking to the, to the Ephesian elders at this point and they don't want him to go because there's danger in Jerusalem. So we'll pick it up in Acts chapter 20 and verse 18. And when they were come to him, that's the Ephesian elders, he said unto them, that is Paul said to them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner uh, I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine and with many tears, with trials here, if you will, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Kept back nothing. See, what's profitable to us? Talk about hell. Talk about sin. Don't just skip over those things and go on and talk about the flowery things that get people to walk a flowery path of love through the rest of their life and be kind and gentle to others. Even though Jesus was just that, Jesus was also uh, one who talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Talk more about sin, if you will. And so Paul said here in verse 20, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit, not in chains, Bound by the Holy Spirit. He has a calling on his life. He has a burden to fulfill. The Holy Spirit has convicted him to go. And so I go bound in the Spirit in verse 22 unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Spirit witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. 
God witnesses everywhere if he has willing vessels to go do it. Even though there's danger there, he said, and waiting for him. So in verse 24, but none of these things move me. They're not going to distract me from my task, from my burden, from the Lord. They're not going to get me off course. They're not going to derail me. Nothing's going to stop me from teaching and preaching Jesus. Testifying and witnessing. Nothing is going to stop me. None of these things are going to move me off my course. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. That's the issue right there. Peter and John and the other apostles, their life was in danger. Literally in danger. Did they stop teaching and in the name of Christ because their life was in danger? No. We're going to see where they, they were jumped on opportunity to do it even though they knew it was coming. And so if you look there <clears throat> uh, in verse uh, 25, it says, um, or in 24, we'll continue. I don't count my life dear to myself so that I might, if we count our life dear to ourselves, we won't finish our course with joy. We can't count our life. We can't count anything about our life. We can't count our reputation as dear unto ourselves. Why? That we might finish our course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. We all have a ministry. Ministry means service. Every person that's saved by the grace of God is called to serve. Serve who? Serve God. Serve His will. Serve His way. Do things God's way. So then in verse 25, he said, Now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I testify unto you this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel of God. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So we go back to our text in Acts chapter 5 and we take a look at these apostles who literally have this undaunted faith in the face of great danger. Now, the first point I want to make here, and again, the, the message is undaunted faith. It's going to start in verse 12 here in Acts chapter 5 and go down to the end of the chapter. Today, we're going to saw off on the first part of this message. And the first point on and this message is the power of obedience. The power of obedience. In order to have undaunted faith, literally not going to be deterred by even threats to, to be killed, that we have to have the power of obedience. And our obedience uh, brings the power of God into our life. Look at verse 12 here in Acts chapter 5. And by the hands of the apostles, literally through the vessel or through the agency of the apostles, uh, by the hands is an idiomatic speech in those days that uh, doesn't literally mean that they're the source of the strength and the ability and, and to do these, but they're vessels or agency of God to do it. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Well, a couple of things here. Many signs and wonders. Look back to chapter 2 and verse 43. This is not the first time... <clears throat> Chapter 2 and uh, verse 43, it says there, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And then, um, if you look at uh, chapter 4 and verse 29, it says there, uh, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, this after they have threatened um, uh, the second time. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that the signs and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And so give us, they were threatened not to ever teach in the name of Jesus. They go to the Lord and say, Father, give us the courage to do that. You see, they didn't, they didn't, they disregarded the danger and they looked back to God at their obligation and the calling on their life. And what are we doing? We, we, we look around us and we check out what might be expedient or profitable for us to do instead of what God wants us to do in being obedient to His Word. 
And literally, signs and wonders. Now, the signs and wonders confirmed, if you will, the, 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 the power of God. Because remember, Peter and John said that the lame man was healed. That's what triggered all of this stuff. The lame man that was healed was done by the power of Jesus. Jesus is the one who healed him in the name of Jesus. So going forward in the name of Jesus, well, here we see these signs and wonders, and they're just giving authenticity to the fact that Jesus is the one, and He's going to keep healing. And we see that happening over in chapter 5, and there we see it in, in chapter 4. And, and uh, we, if we go back to the Gospels, Jesus told His apostles that He had called that you're going to be able to do even greater things than I have done. Signs and wonders. And here they are in the midst of the height of this. The place where they're meeting here in verse 12 is Solomon's porch. This is where all these signs and wonders are being worked. Now, Solomon's porch at that time, remember, that's where the lame man was sitting at Solomon's porch. That's where he was laying, where they laid him daily at the temple uh, to go in. They laid him there, and he was healed there, and then he went into the temple. Well, Solomon's porch became popularized with all these people getting saved, became the place where the Christians were meeting at that time. So this is where they were meeting, and that's why Peter and the other apostles were there, and the church was meeting there, and you see these signs and wonders, um, and not just signs and wonders, there's a word that characterizes it many. There were tons of signs and wonders that were going on, and it says, wrought among the people, Literally, they being worked, if you will, or eventuating before the people, because God was the one who was energizing it. And so they wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's board. The church was united. It was united. We saw in, in chapter 4 how that people were selling land and other possessions and taking that money and giving it. There was such a, a, a harmony among the Christians in the early church. And we see, it, uh, see that recorded again there. In verse 13, um, and of the rest, the rest of the people. So we find that the apostles who were leading this, all these people uh, were being saved and they were being healed and signs and wonders were abundant and all of the Christians were together in harmony. They were unified according to the scripture here that they were with one accord, and the rest of the people were talking about unbelievers. The people who had not received Christ by faith, but who were still questioning and doubting and sort of holding back a little bit. They were amazed at what was happening, but they still weren't committed in faith in Christ. Of the rest, they literally, the word durst means they dare, dared no man of the rest of these, literally the unbelievers who were taking all this in, none of them dared to join themselves to them. There was too much risk. These people are, are at huge risk because they've been threatened by the highest authority in Israel. The Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, if you will, of the Jewish people. So they dared not join themselves with him, but what were they doing? They were magnifying the apostles because all of these great things were happening and just tons of people were being healed. Lots of them. It says, in fact, in verse 13, and believers were the more added to the church. It means they were constantly, the more means they were constantly being added to the Lord, multitudes of both of men and women, tons, untold numbers of people. People were being healed from all different kinds. And look on, though, there's a characterization here. It says, in so much, there was so much healing going on, and there were so many people being saved, insomuch in verse 15, that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Peter's shadow never healed a person. God healed them. The, the shadow, they were putting them under the shadow that Peter's shadow, when he passed by, might heal them because they saw Peter as the leader. And they believed that just if his shadow were to go over, they'd be healed. Not the way it worked. That was a superstition. Uh, if you go on to the next verse, it says, There came also a multitude out of the cities. So there were cities around Jerusalem. So the other cities, people were coming in multitudes from out other cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them who were 
literally um, demon-possessed. They were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. Here's a key phrase. Every one. Every person brought from all these cities that were sick or they had demon possessed, every one of them, the demons were cast out and the people were healed. Not one failed to be healed or devoid of the demon possession. Every one of them were healed. They say, wow, this looks like a, a, like a bunch of piranha and a feeding frenzy. You know, it's just, woo, it's just blossoming. Well, it is. It, 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 I, I just, the, no wonder there were so many people standing by in amazement. If you didn't have faith in Christ, you're still amazed by what's going on. Absolute power of God. And why was this happening? That's the point. Why, why was all of this, all of these wonders that were being wrought and the signs and the healing and every one of them were healed? Why? Because when Peter and John were threatened not to ever speak in the name of Jesus again, they kept preaching in Jesus' name. So God, that power, that obedience brought the power of God and it just poured out like it's never been poured out before. Literally people being healed. Now, you got, I know, you know, we have our Facebook page, uh, church Facebook page. We now are reaching people, have reached people to the tune of a quarter million people every month in over 150 countries. We're, we're almost all the way around the world. Uh, we don't have China or North Korea. I don't know how to get in there. You've got you to gotta lie to get your way in there. But I don't know how you get over there. But the Lord has taken what we started out with just two or three people and has taken it all the way around the world. But all the way around the world, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. But the message is going out to people, and people are, are, are reading the Word of God. You know, the Lord says, take the Word of God and take it from your doorstep to Judea, Jerusalem, and to the far parts of the world. Well, so we're doing that, and people are, are, are attaching themselves to the Word. But... <clears throat> So what's happening is through all of those contacts that I have around the world, there's untold numbers of them in foreign countries particularly, not the only place, <clears throat> typically in third world countries or borderline third world countries where people have gone in and they now teach deliverance and healing and they teach the people in the church how to do this and they have classes on how to do it. What kind of classes did Peter and John take? They didn't. It's the power of God that does this. We be obedient to God, and then God's power gets poured out in mass. And literally multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of people were being saved because of the obedience of a few apostles. That's the power of God. We, we can't see beyond the embarrassment of witnessing about Christ. We can't see beyond the risk that we think we're taking by testifying of the Lord. We can't see beyond that. If we would be bold in our witness and our testimony and share the word of God and the, and the way of salvation with other people, what we'd find is the power of God, like it was here, not necessarily the same way, but we'll find the power of God working through our obedience because God is the one who adds to the church. We don't. We don't add. Our job is to be obedient to the Lord. So we take the word wherever we can. And then that brings the power of God wherever it's sent. Because we know Isaiah said that God's word shall not return void. But it will accomplish his purposes wherever it's sent. Guess how it's sent? We gotta speak it. We gotta we gotta get the message out. You write it in a message, you speak it in a word, you sing it in a song, you say it in a prayer. However, you get the message out, we need to get the message out. It'll bring God's power down and in people because 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation and as the obedience to the gospel in spreading the word. So literally we see this power of obedience here. And unlike today, we see faith healers and we've seen them before. I often said, you know, there were a few in our country <clears throat> and, <clears throat> you know, we had all Roberts out there bringing all these people in. Ernest Angley was out there and we had all these people and they were supposedly he lining them up on stage and they were here healed and you're healed and you're healed and they're all getting slain in the spirit. We didn't see that kind of activity by the apostles. We just saw them preaching the word of God and God was doing the healing. <laughs> That's what they were doing. And, but <clears throat> I often said, why did Oral, reason I brought his name up, why didn't Oral, and Oral Roberts built a hospital? Why would he need a hospital if he could deliver all these people and heal them? Because his show portrayed, if you just come up on my stage, you're going to be healed. Ernest Angley, so you build a hospital, why? Because they're not all healed. They portray it to look like that. <clears throat> Here in Jerusalem, with Peter and John, every single person brought was healed. Bar none. Look at the end of that, verse 16 again. <clears throat> it says, and them... Who were, uh, and let's read 16 again. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them who were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. <clears throat> that's the power of God. <clears throat> now, second point is so that's literally the power of obedience. I want to talk about the power of boldness. Uh, beginning in verse 17. <clears throat> then the high priest rose up, and all they. Uh, that were with him. So we had the, the high priest here. Um, <clears throat> and it's either Annas or Caiaphas. Um, it's one of those two. They rose up and all they that were with him. And these are the Sadducees here. Because it says that. Which is the sect of the Sadducees. And were filled with what? Indignation. They were jealous. Because Peter and John were leading this huge entourage. And just... Hundreds and thousands upon thousands of people were coming and getting saved by the grace of God. And there was a, quite a stir among the people because everybody brought from outside of the city and those inside that were brought, they were all healed. This is, this is all done in the name of Jesus. And the high priest and the Sadducees didn't like it. Literally jealous. <clears throat> they were angered. They literally feared that there was going to be an insurrection because this is growing so big, and we'll see more about this. It was growing so big, it was just going to be like a tidal wave and overwhelm them and they'll be gone. They were fearful of the system of religion that they had. There's a lot of that around today. People are fearful that they'll lose their system of religion. People are still clinging on to a system where they ought to have their faith in Christ. And it's not a system, it's faith, if you will. So <clears throat> this opposition to Peter and John was rekindled here and to all the apostles and all the believers. So the high priest rose up, the Sadducees with them, they were filled with indignation. They laid their hands, that is, they arrested the apostles, put them in the common prison. Uh, <clears throat> remember, they were put overnight in a prison before, after they were, and then they were threatened. Um, and then it says... But an angel, the angel, literally an angel, but an angel of the Lord by night, during the night, opened the prison doors, brought them forth. They brought the apostles forth because it says they arrested the apostles. Um, and so the angel of the Lord came by night in verse 19 and opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Now, this is interesting. The high priest, the Sadducees, they go and they get them, they arrest them, they put them in jail and lock them up. And while they're in there, in the middle of the night, an angel comes, opens the doors, and frees them and says, go out and speak and teach in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Just what they were arrested for. They hadn't even been in there but a couple of hours. And they said, go 
the angel said to them, go, in verse 20, go, stand, and speak. In the temple, in the temple, that was the center of the Jewish religion. That was where they met. Go to speak in the temple to the people. All the words of this, this life literally is the life we live as a believer. It's from the, from the moment of salvation until the, until the eternity in glory, right? And it's this life. It's eternal life. It begins with our salvation. And when they heard that, when the apostles heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning. They didn't waste any time. They could hardly wait for day to break. And boom, they're in the temple doing what? And they're teaching. They're teaching in the name of Jesus. Oh, look at the end of verse 21. We'll stop there for right now. So, immediately, and we see here that delivered by the angel. See, this is, this is the power of boldness. Their boldness, when they were threatened, they, went, they still went out and they, they preached and they taught in the name of Jesus. When they get arrested again, you know why the angel delivered them? Why God delivered them with the angel? So they could go out and continue what they determined resolutely to do. To continue witness and testifying, teaching in the name of Jesus. God wasn't going to allow the high priest... The Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, which is the Supreme Court of, of Israel, wasn't going to allow any of them to stop it. They're just going to keep on going. So, the end of verse 21, we've seen the power of obedience, we've seen the power of boldness, and now we're going to look at the persecution of the obedient and bold, the persecution. So, in verse 21, in the middle there, <clears throat> where I stop, it says, but... So they started teaching again in the morning. They're set free from the prison. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together. So they went into their secret conclave, and they gathered together. Um, the high priest and the council is the Sanhedrin, if you will. Seventy members plus the high priest uh, together. And all the senate, and these are the past leaders, the Pharisees, and all of that. All these religious leaders gathered together of the children of Israel. And they sent to the prison to have them brought. Go on over to the prison now and bring those people back over here. <laughs> Look at verse 22. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned. And here's what they said in verse 23. The prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. The interesting thing is, if in the earlier verse we read, the angel opened the doors of the prison. When they went in to, to get them, the doors were shut and they were locked. <laughs> they were shut and locked. And they came back and gave this message. Uh, everything was secure. The doors are shut. The doors are locked. The, the, the guards are standing where they should be to guard the prison. Nobody's fallen asleep. Everything's like it should. But there's no prisoners there. <laughs> That's the power of God working. And what we see here is God has delivered them out of the prison so they can go courageously and boldly as they had done and continue preaching the word of God and they're going to be further persecuted for doing that. The apostles knew that when they, when they went early in the morning to the temple and started preaching and the high authorities knew that they were going to still persecute them. But what they didn't know is they couldn't stop them. So what we find in, <clears throat> in verse 24 is now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they literally... They doubted of them. That means they were perplexed, thoroughly perplexed to the point of despair, if you will, concerning them, how this would grow. They were so worried about this thing getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. They want to stop it. I believe that's why the, the ungodly people in our country from all uh, angles of life are trying to stop Christianity. Because God's going to have it grow. And we know the days are going to get worse. But, you know, God's going God's to keep, keep the Lord from coming to take His church home until the last sinner gets saved by the grace of God. So, <clears throat> they, they, they 
were really concerned, and this, this, they were in despair and desperation about how this would continue to grow. That's why they locked them out of the, of the city. And now they're back. So in verse 25, then came one person and told them, saying, Behold, the ones you're looking for uh, that you put in prison are standing in the temple, and they're teaching. Well, they knew what they were going to be teaching. They're teaching Jesus. So verse 26, it says, Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence. Why did they not harm them or treat them roughly in taking them to the high priest and the Sanhedrin? It tells us the end of verse 26. The four is the reason why. For they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. They, there was such a huge multitude, they were outnumbered out there. If they'd have gone out there and started treating those people badly because all these people, they were highly esteeming the apostles for what was being done. They knew something great was happening here. A lot of them didn't know that it was God. All those unbelievers standing by who were, didn't want to associate with them because they, they knew they'd be put themselves at risk of being killed because they'd already been threatened. But neither did they put faith in Christ. So they're sort of out there still doubting and perplexed about this whole thing, but amazed at it. And so what we find is uh, they're going to they're going to bring them back in now, uh, and so they um, they're teaching in the temple. So in, in, in the temple, so in verse twenty six, when the captain with the officers brought them without violence, they feared the people that they should have been stoned. They thought they might be killed. So in verse twenty seven, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council. That's the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked them this in verse twenty eight. He said, did not we strictly, uh, and um, this, the word literally means strictly, strictly command you, it's an edict, that you should not teach in this name. He couldn't even say the name of Jesus. He hated it so much. He hated it so much. Now, among the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in angels. The angels are the one that set them free. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Christ had been resurrected. And, he's, and Christ is the one who's the power behind all of, this, um, all of this work that the apostles are doing. The Sadducees don't believe that. But yet, they're, they're, I'm sure they were perplexed because it tells us they were to the point of desperation because in the name of Jesus, all this is going on. Jesus had to have something to do with it. They got to stop it. So the high priest here said, or the council um, said, Don't, didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name, that is the name of Jesus. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. <laughs> so, they're afraid that they're going to be die now because they, they really fear this insurrection. And we commanded you not to ever do this again. And now you're endangering us. Um, and catch this. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. How does a city or an area get filled? Doctrine is teaching. How does it get filled with the teaching of Scripture? By people who have faith in Christ, who take it upon themselves to do the work of the Lord and to go out and tell people about the teaching of Christ, the doctrine. That's how. Now they did it. They were, they were called as apostles to do that. But every believer saved by the grace of God is called to speak of Jesus. Every believer. Not one of us are to keep our mouth shut and keep our faith quiet. What kind of faith do you have if you're not even willing to talk to somebody else about the one who has saved you by his grace, given you the free gift, the free gift of salvation, set you free from the bondage of sin, and has guaranteed to you an inheritance and an eternity in heaven where it's perfect? How do you stay quiet about that? See, Peter and John couldn't. Man, did they ever stir it up? Did they ever stir it up? That's why I call this undaunted faith. Despite all the threats, they kept going and going and going. Put them in jail, 
you know, and, and the angel comes and lets them out, get over to the temple and start preaching. First thing in the morning, bam, there they are teaching, and they come and they get arrested again. So you don't think this is something to be taken lightly. Peter and John were literally putting their life on the line every time they mentioned the name of Jesus. Because all it took was one person to run back to the high priest or the, the Sanhedrin or the Sadducees or the Pharisees and say, I heard this guy teaching in Jesus' name again. Oh boy, they didn't run and got him. And that's what happened here. One guy came and told him, says, hey, you know, they're over here at the temple preaching. That's what they said. They're going to be ratted out. If we start teaching in the name of Jesus, people are going to call, call us out. They don't want anything to do with us. They don't want to hear that. But folks, we can't, we can't be ashamed of the gospel. We can't be ashamed of the gospel. And if we're not willing to freely and openly talk about it, we're ashamed of it. Let me tell you why. I'll give you a good analogy and we'll close with this. Do you have grandchildren? Many in here do. Maybe not. You might know some people that do. Um, <clears throat> but those who have grandchildren, they're like precious gems. Right? There's like precious gems. And we, we openly, and it doesn't even take, somebody just looks at us and he was like, hey, let me show you a picture. Look, look. There's my two, I went to the bowling alley the other day and a guy comes running to me down the, hall, down the aisle and he says, hey, look, I got a new grandbaby. We just openly and freely, it's, 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 it's no big deal. It's, in fact, we enjoy it. It's fun. It's what we want to do. Well, what about the gospel? See, we're not ashamed of our grandkids. We're not ashamed of them. We're not ashamed of our husband or wife. We're not ashamed of our family. We're not ashamed of the things that we enjoy doing, our hobbies, our interests, or whatever that might be. So we talk to people about it. Golfers love to talk about golf, and bowlers like to talk about bowling. Hunters like to talk about hunting. You know, And those who make quilts love to talk about quilting. I mean, everybody loves to talk about their interest and their hobbies. But when it comes to the gospel, we sort of don't have that same interest. We don't have that same intensity. We don't have that same desire. Because we're ashamed in some circles, at least, if not in many circles in our life, to free, freely talk about Jesus. And then we, we leave a situation and we maybe the Lord stirs our heart and we say, well, yeah, I didn't really find a good opportunity to get it in. Because we'd have had to interrupt the conversation and say, let me tell you about somebody, right? We need to break the ice and to go forward. I mean, these, these guys were just doing the Lord's work. They're no different than you and me. No different. They're people that God called and they're literally willing to do God's beck and call. And any vessel that will, that will live an honorable life before the Lord, vessel being a person, any vessel willing to live an honorable life before the Lord will be used by God to do great things. It doesn't have to be on a great scale. It may be a witness here and a testimony there. But we sort of even use that as, a, well, you know, I've, I've led like three people to the Lord. Or, you know, I, I talked about Jesus to you know, one person in the last two months. You know, we sort of think we're doing our job here. How many people did you tell about your grandbaby? Everybody you met. You called them, you wrote them, you texted them, you showed them a picture, you went and visited them, you called them over, invite them. You know, but we don't have the same desire to carry the message of Christ that we do of our personal interest. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And we sort of sit around and look at each other and say, okay, what needs to change? We just need to be resolute and undaunted in our faith. In other words, it doesn't matter who it is, if it's a family member, a friend, a neighbor, whoever it is, we're going to bring Jesus' name up and talk about him. Even if we need to interrupt the conversation, because it may end without us bringing it up. And it didn't come up because we didn't interrupt the conversation to do it. And then somebody's saying bye and say, well, you know, we're going to talk to him about the Lord, but okay, see you later. You know, it needs to be on our agenda. It's got to be on our agenda. We call ourselves Christians. 
Christians are truly, by definition, servants of the Lord. And we're not serving Him if we're not talking about Him. People that aren't saved can live a good life. They can live a good life in the eyes of the world. You know, not harm people, you know, not, not, you know, not be jealous and envious and hate and all that kind of stuff and sort of love everybody. I know a lot of people, they're, they're very kind and very generous and very loving. And sometimes you look at them if you're not close to them and you think, well, I wonder if they're a Christian or not. There's a lot of those people around that are living a good life in terms of the world. But we know there's none good but God. And the only way that we're good is that God puts his righteousness on our account. That's how. So what we don't know is who's saved and not saved. And even if they are saved, boy, what a, great, what a great witness and testimony to talk to people about the Lord. And they talk back to you about the Lord. And then you get this little thing going on. And say, oh, I didn't know you are saved. And then you have something that's beneficial for both of us in a, in a conversation or in a group conversation where we sort of edify each other and build each other up. So it's good, if you will, to speak about the Lord Jesus wherever we are. Are we willing to do that? And you know what we see here is light years ahead of where most of us are, if not all of us. We don't even have threats on our lives like these people. The people that were threatening them had the authority to have them killed. They could have charged them with blasphemy and stoned them to death. We'll see as we get over to chapter 7, that's exactly what happened to Stephen. Because he continued to preach that Jesus was God, and they called that blasphemy against God because Jesus was not the Son of God. He was not the Messiah. And, the, and Stephen knew that, and Stephen still preached the Word of God. Another guy that got in trouble. Paul's one. And all of the writers of Scripture were the same way. Where do we fit into the equation? We need to look introspectively at ourselves and find out what is it that needs to change in our life. And it needs to change now because I keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Now's the day to make a decision. I'm going to be resolute in my faith and I'm going to go out undauntingly, if you will, determined that I'm going to carry the message of Jesus wherever I go. And people are going to know about him. And if I lose friends, if I lose family members or whatever it is, so be it. It'll just have to cost me. Let's stop soft peddling the gospel. Because we tell, sort of tell people, you know, hey, well, you know, if you, if, you, if you sort of, you know, follow Jesus, your life will be so much better. It's a lie of the devil. It's a lie of the devil. Uh, the believer is much more subject to persecution and risk and death than unbelievers. We're not willing to expose ourselves. Uh, to people on a personal level that way. We're ashamed of our faith. We can't be ashamed of our faith. What did Jesus say? If you're ashamed to confess me before people, I'll be ashamed to confess you before the Father. I mean, it's really that simple. Let's, talk, let's, get, let's get right with God. Bold and courageous. Understanding we're going to be persecuted. It may not be by the Sanhedrin and most likely will not be, but we're going to be persecuted by friends and neighbors and others. And it may come in the form of people just falling away. It may come from others that say, I don't want to hear that. You talk about that anymore. And so we shut up, don't talk about it, and they're, because we want to be remain friends with them. And we sort of use the excuse, if I just remain friends with them, they'll see my good life. Well, baloney. Now I understand the passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that says that, you know, uh, a, a, a married woman just by her behavior and actions can lead her husband to the Lord. I do understand that. But that's not what God's called us to do. It's not what God's called us to do. We need to talk about Jesus. We need to talk about Him. Because, you know, people, people can see that, that good behavior, but eventually they're going to get to the point where they want to know what it is. But not everybody's going to be that inquisitive. So we need to tell them. And we don't know the difference on who they are. Let's stand together, if you will. Oh, we don't need a song. It's okay. Yeah, we'll just... Let's stand together for prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank You for Your love, for Your mercy, and for Your grace. What a great day it's been around Your Word. And we ask, Father, that as we have received that which You've given us to us today, 
that will receive it with gladness and with a desire and intention to do something about our testimony and our witness and our talking about Jesus. May we share Jesus wherever we go and to whomever we meet. May people know the one that we serve, that we've put our faith in. And we know, Father, that you'll strengthen us in the process. We know that uh, our reputation will be at risk, our Our life even may be at risk or somewhere in between. And Father, regardless of the consequences, may we always be bold and courageous to witness about Jesus Christ because He is our Lord and Savior. We give you praise and thanks and ask that you'd watch over and keep us as we make our through the coming week. Bring us back at the next appointed time. Uh, Restore power for all those who don't have power, Father, among our number and throughout our community. We just simply ask these things, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.